Charlemagne, je vais essayer Oslem. Ok. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa rahmatullah. Do I really need this? <laughs> yeah. 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 Bismillah alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. We praise him subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king, the master, the sustainer the creator of the seven heavens and the earth, and we send peace and blessings upon his beloved Muhammad. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. It is a great pleasure for me to be here. I want to thank one ummah for inviting me, for the brothers and the sisters that are involved in this university that opened their doors. Wallah, it's a great pleasure. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor you, to bless you, and to bring much needed mercy towards this ummah. Amen. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, the state of the Ummah, I'm sure most of you know. The state of the Ummah is shocking wherever you look. In fact, someone once said to me jokingly, he said, and forgive me, I don't know the title, you know, you know sometimes you watch the morning show and they have a person that, that does the hand movements. Yeah, you know the sign language. He said, you know, if there was ever a news report about the Muslim Ummah, I can do the hand movements with one gesture of one finger that will explain the Muslim Ummah wherever you go. And I'm sure you know which finger he was going to raise. <laughs> that wherever you go, the condition of the Muslim Ummah is as such. And I'm sure all of you know, politically, you know, internationally, internally, wherever you go, Muslims are suffering and suffering massively. And when we come to talk about, well, okay, so what's the solution? How do we fix the problem? There's a million and one excuses. There's a million and one this, that, our leaders, politicians, our imams, our mashayikh, our this, our that, and the other. But never will you ever hear, and never do you ever see from anyone, stand up and say that the problem with this ummah is me. Unfortunately, my brothers and my sisters, there used to be a time in this ummah, there used to be a time in history, just in general, amongst Muslims and non-Muslims alike, when things were clear and people were honest enough. Today we're, we're bullied by political correctness and this, that and the other. You know, I always use this example and forgive me. There used to be a time when someone, if someone was obese, fat like myself, yeah I use the word fat, right? If someone was fat like myself, today we have a million and one reasons as to, yeah look, you know, he's overweight because of this, that and the other. No, there used to be a time when if you were fat, you were fat because you ate too much and you moved too little. And it was simple and everyone knew, like no one argued. It was very clear as to why the brother's obese. Brother, you eat too much, you eat at the wrong times, and you obviously, you don't exercise. No one ever spoke about it. Today we want theories and this, that, and the other, and philosophical reasons as to why the man is obese. It's clear why he's obese. You know, it's like the man that went to the doctor. An obese man went to the doctor for a random check. So you guys that have his blood test, and then as the results are coming back. And how many of us are guilty of this? So, before the doctor could say anything, he says to him, Doctor, let me, let, you know, let me tell you, obesity runs in my family. <laughs> so the doctor says to him, Brother, let me tell you, it's not obesity that runs in your family. He says, no one runs in your family. <laughs> <laughs> excuses. Muslims today have become experts when it comes to excuses. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters, honestly, the problem with the Ummah today is you and I. <clears throat> we are the Ummah. We make up the Ummah. Look at your own condition. Look at your own condition. We are the reason why the Ummah is where it is today. There used to be a time when things were very simple. There used to be a time where if someone was obese and they wanted to lose weight, it wasn't a topic yet. It's not something people used to argue about. If you wanted to lose weight, you had to eat right and work hard and break a sweat. And it was known. Today, no, it shakes and this, that and the other. And you can do operations and cut your stomach and rubber bands and this shake and that shake. And while yes, it gives you a 
quick result, but the side effects. Why? Because there's a way and there's a system to fix things. And if you try to cheat the system, while you may, while it may appear to you that you have a, you know, that you resolve the issue, there are side effects that you cannot run away from. I had a friend of mine who did, you know, did the stomach operation, lost massive weight in a number of weeks, looked amazing on the outside. I remember one time he happened to take his shirt in front of me. He happened to raise his hands, and excess skin that just sagged off his hand. I was like, oh, what is that? What? Because it's unnatural to lose so much weight in such little, it's unnatural. And if you think that fixing the Ummah is a pill, or someone getting up giving a fancy speech, and everything's going to be hunky-dory, and we're all going to hold hands at the end and sing Kumbaya, you're wrong. <laughs> to fix the condition of the Ummah, you and I have to work hard. It's going to require your whole life. That's the only way. It's the only way to fix the Ummah. It's you and I. My brothers and sisters, when you chose to be a Muslim, and let me tell you, no one is forced to be a believer. There's this massive misconception. Islam, religion is a choice. Every individual has an option. It's a choice that you make. You either choose to be a believer or you don't. Don't come to me and feed me this year, I'm forced. You know, this, this idea of, you know what, well, I just happen to be a Muslim. My humble opinion, and I don't have any Islamic backing to, 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 to support my claim, so I need to make this clear. These are my personal opinions. Those that are born Muslims, and those that are born whatever religion they are, I believe that there's no difference between them. The only time they differ is when the individual says, I choose to be a Muslim. Why? Because I understand my faith. I believe in Allah. I believe in Islam. Now it's a choice that I make. Now you shine. Being born Muslim is just default. Nothing special about you. But when you choose this faith, I choose Allah. I choose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I choose Islam. Now you're special. Now you've got something to put on the table. When you and I chose Islam, you became a part of the Ummah. And the Prophet of Allah, when he gave the analogy of the Ummah, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu he gave the analogy. He says, the analogy of my Ummah is like the analogy of one body. The Muslims, they are like one body. What an amazing analogy. He says, when a part of the body hurts, the whole body stays up the night in sleeplessness, fighting off the pain and the infection. Today, we no longer feel like a body. Today, oh no, 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 he's a Palestinian Muslim. I'm a UK Muslim. No, he's an Australian Muslim. No, he... Where did this un-Islamic concept come from? If you're a Muslim, then you're my brother. If you're a Muslim, then you're my sister. And you're a part of the body. And it is my responsibility to protect you, to honor you, to preserve you, to assist you, to help you, to guide you, to aid you in any way, shape or form. We are responsible for the condition of the Ummah. And my brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, maybe this is a bit harsh for some. When Allah deals with this Ummah, He deals with us as a whole. Allah doesn't deal with the Muslims as individuals. He deals with them as a whole. When they do good, the blessings and the khairat and the barakah and the, the mercy of Allah, it falls and it descends and it falls upon everyone. The good and the bad gets it. And when you do bad, the opposite is also true. When the curse and the punishment of Allah falls, it falls on the whole lot. This is how Allah deals with His Ummah. Now I'm sorry if this works with you, doesn't work with you, doesn't change. That's why every individual, every Muslim is important. What you do, my brother and my sister, what you do, 
has an effect. It has a ripple effect. Your actions, whether it be good or bad, has a direct effect on the children of Palestine, on the children of this, that, and the other. Everything you do has a direct effect. Why? Because we're all one body. We need to start thinking like a body and not as individuals. This group and that group. It's become sickening. There are no groups. He's a Muslim. Today it's all about categories. Who do you belong to? What's your masjid? Who's your iman? Where are you from? What's your understanding? What's your creed? What's your this, that and the other? What's this nonsense? I'm a Muslim. Part of the body. We are one. We've always been one. We worship one Allah. We follow one prophet. We read one Quran. We pray in one direction. We've always been one. Why do we insist on making it many? And who's responsible for this? It's you and I. It's you and I. Stop thinking this. No, me. It's my responsibility. People come to me all the time. My marriage is failing. Why is it failing? I married the, I married the devil himself, man. <laughs> Have you met my wife? Her name is Lucifer. <laughs> what the crap is that? What are you smoking? <laughs> God forbid your marriage is failing because you're a miserable husband. People come to me all the time. You, you think you can have a couple of words with my son? He's driving me up the wall. Why is your son so terrible? Oh, I don't know, man. It's TV, his mother, it's his cousins, it's school, it's the, everything in the world. God forbid it has anything to do with you. Brother, what do you do for work? And then everyone becomes so humble. <laughs> Brother, you, you understand. I'm a taxi driver. <laughs> okay. Uh, I drive the taxi for 16 hours of the day. So while you're driving your cab for 16 hours of the day, who's raising this child of yours? What do you have kids for? <coughs> if you're not going to be man enough to fulfill, then what do you have them for? I don't understand. You don't have a TV at home? Talk to us. We can supply you with something. My brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. The condition of the Ummah, the condition of Islam will not change until you and I change, until you and I wake up, until you and I start taking some old-fashioned responsibility. Me, what can I offer? You know, when John F., you know, when John F. Kennedy made the famous statement, he says, don't ask what your country can do for you. Rather, ask what you can do for your country. What can you do for Islam? What can you do to change perceptions, to change our image, to change our condition? What are you ready and prepared to do? Uh, I'm busy. Brother, forgive me, man. I got work. Brother, forgive me. I'm getting married soon. Brother, forgive me. You know, I got studies. Well, if every single one of us is busy, then who's going to fix it? Experts at pointing fingers, experts at making excuses, so many, so many chiefs, no Indians. We love it. We love it. And my brothers and sisters, like I'm saying, when Allah deals with the Ummah, He deals with us as a whole. He, 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 this, is, this is Allah's way. You know, when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I'm sure you've heard the hadith. But I really want you to live the hadith with me. Try to understand it. Put yourself in the scenario. Why do you think the Prophet shared these stories with us? What, for entertainment purposes? Do you think the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you think our Prophet conveyed these stories to us? Why? So that we can entertain our children when they go to sleep? No. 
Allah says in the Quran, don't you know? Don't you reflect? Don't you understand? Don't you sit down and comprehend these stories? The Prophet of Allah, when he tells us about the story of Musa and Moses, yeah? Listen, listen to this story, please, and try to live it with me. Moses and his people went through a drought. Severe, severe drought, punishment. No water, people were dying, animals were dying, crops were not growing. It was serious, it, it was a serious trial and tribulation that was affecting everyone. So the people came to Moses. And we know the story of the people of Moses. Their faith was already very, very on edge at all times. Their, their, their faith was with the wind. Anything used to tip them over. So they came to Moses complaining. More or less, oh Moses, you know, Moses, you claim to be a man of God. Look at us, we're dying, we're suffering. Where is your Lord? Why isn't he helping us? So Moses and his people, they go out to the desert. And Moses raises his hands and he asks Allah for rain. Naturally, you're a prophet. He asked Allah for rain. The people thinking, Khalas, the man raised his hands. They're getting ready. Rain's going to fall. But nothing fell. You know, and I always say to the brothers, I always like to, you know, I always like to dive into the story, you know. I think, wow, imagine Moses at that time. Talk about heat under the collar. Don't worry, I got this. <laughs> no, no rain. <laughs> then no rain. Talk about pressure. So Moses says to Allah, he says, oh Allah, I asked for rain and nothing fell. What's going on? Now listen to what Allah says to Moses. He says to him, O Musa, O Moses, from amongst your people there is one sinner. And because of him and him alone, I've deprived the rain from falling. How many of us Muslims commit sin every single day in abundance? And we've been fooled here. Hey, hey, hey. Only God can judge me, huh? Leave me alone, bro. None of your business. Let me do as I please. This is an Islamic concept. That only God can judge me. And that, you know what? It's none of your business. And let me do as I please. And I'm free to do whatever I want. I'm sorry, brother and sister. No, you're not free. When you chose to be a Muslim, you became a part of the body. When you became a part of the body, what you do affects me and my wife and my children and my community and my country. I mean, imagine. Allah allowed a prophet and his people and innocent women and children and livestock animals for crying out loud. Crops. Allah allowed all to suffer because of the sins of one man. How many of us feel responsible? Nah, it's gonna undo me, bro. So Musa turns to his people and says, Oh, my people, amongst you is a sinner. Come forward, make yourself known. You know, and I always say to the boys, you know, I always imagine how the man felt. Imagine you were that sinner. And you came to know that, oh my God, me, my sins that I thought I was doing in secret that no one knew about. My sins are causing so much harm and distress. Imagine how he felt. You and I, we sin on a daily basis and you feel proud about, if anything, we boast. We boast. Today, young men are becoming embarrassed to say... Young man, he's 20 years old and he's embarrassed to admit that he's a virgin. Why? Because he's going to become the joke at uni. <laughs> he's still a virgin. He's <laughs> still a virgin. <clears throat> We've become shy. Proud. We sit amongst it. How many women have you slept with? We, we, we thrive. We actually boast about how much sin we've committed. So the man realizes, whoa, whoa, because of me, my people are suffering. So he turns to Allah and he repents. 
So Moses is waiting for the man to come forward. No one comes forward. So Musa, obviously now he's left with no option. He turns back, he turns to Allah, raises his hands, asks Allah for rain, and amazingly the rain starts falling down. So of course Musa is happy, but he's boggled. He's thinking, what's going on? He says, oh Allah, I asked you for rain. You said there's a sinner. I asked for the sinner to come forward. No one came out. I asked for rain a second time, and now the rain is falling. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa. He says, Ya Musa, when you asked me for rain the first time, I deprived it because of the man who was sinning. Because of him and him alone, I deprived the rain. Then that same man turned to me in repentance. He asked for my forgiveness and I accepted. And because of him and him alone, I have now allowed the rain to fall down. So Musa says to Allah, he says, Ya Allah, Tell me who he is. Allah says to Musa, He says, oh Musa, I didn't expose him when he was a sinner. What makes you think I'm going to expose him now that he's repented? And turn back to me. You know, when we hear the story, we're all wowed by the, oh wow. And Allah allowed the rain to fall back down and happily, and everyone is happy ever after. That's not what impresses me about the story. What impresses me is this sinner was man enough to admit that he was in the wrong. He was man enough to admit and to acknowledge that my actions are affecting my people. And he was man enough to take responsibility and say, I am going to change and I am going to do what is upon me. And he did that and Allah accepted it and they all benefited from it. We need to change. You and I need to change. You and I need to wake up and come back to our deen. You know, every single Muslim is so caught up in wanting to let every, every non-Muslim know how great and amazing Islam is. Yet you and I don't live the Islam that we are claiming to the people. Islam is love and Islam is peace and Islam is harmony. Yet we suffer the most in our own homes. I'm not talking about publicly. In our own homes. We lack love. We lack responsibility. We lack affection towards one another. We're claiming one thing on the outside. This, I'm, I'm telling you, it's clear, open hypocrisy. You know, people come to the masjid. Oh, brother, this, you know, this young man wants to accept Islam. And the people, oh, what a feeling. Whoa, this guy just became Muslim. People all take out their phones and everyone wants to shake his hand and everyone wants to hug him. Of course, it's a nice feeling. You know, whenever I see someone accepting Islam, I fall in depression. You know why? Because there's 50,000 people that are ready to hug him and take photos. And the next morning, someone to just be his friend, be his companion. Not a single, you know how many times, 50,000 people there, this, I'm over exaggerating, usually there's about three, 400 people. Uh, brothers, please, is there anyone that can just take the brother home, let him sleep there the night? Ah, oh, come on, man, I've got girls at home, you know what I mean? No, brother, you know, Allah, I just got married, nah, no, man, you know, wife, my dad knows he's going to shoot me. <laughs> what a slam are we presenting to this poor person? Really, like, what's going on? We're claiming about how beautiful and my brothers and sisters, we need to be a little bit more. Wallahi, we, we really have to be realistic. We need to wake up. You and I really need to start implementing our deen. People are not stupid. We have this sickness of thinking that non-Muslims are ignorant and stupid people. They're not. They're not. People know the difference between right and wrong. People know the difference between fact and fiction. Yes, yes, you might have the few that get caught up in. Yes, but overall people know the dough. Where's Islam in your life? Where's Islam in your life? People walking around scaring the hell out of non-Muslims. Telling them about Sharia Allah and how good it is. And yet you in your own home, you don't implement Sharia. In your own relationship with your wife, you don't implement Sharia. Yet we want to force it down people's throats. The connection.
condemnation of the Ummah is because of you and I. The sins that you do, your shortcomings, your lack of knowledge. Our lack of understanding is affecting the whole. And the condition of the Ummah will not change until we change the condition of ourselves. Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah says He will not change the condition of the people until they do what? Come on, you know it. Until they do what? They until they change the condition of themselves. Until we start changing our hearts. Until we start speaking truth, living truth, having love and compassion towards one another, choosing people over myself. This is deen. The Prophet of Allah in the Sahih Hadith, in the Sahih Hadith, the Prophet of Allah says, none of you will enter paradise. Please, my brothers, try to understand what is happening here. When the Prophet of Allah gave this, gave this hadith, who did he give it to? To the companions who was the greatest. They were the best generation ever. Yet the Prophet of Allah is speaking to them like this. He says to them, hey, none of you will enter paradise until you believe. Until they believe. What are you talking about? They're really Muslims. You know what? He's not talking to them. He's talking to you and I. None of you will enter paradise until you believe. And none of you will truly believe. Sahih hadith, huh? And none of you, none, the exception, none of you will believe. Your iman, your faith will always be. <coughs> What's the... Uh, Maybe, yeah. Your faith will always be deficient. And none of you will truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Give me a Muslim that's implementing this hadith today. If we just implemented this amongst one another, you will see people in thousands flocking to your deen. Until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. <clears throat> Until I love for my sister to, the, to be the most honored like I wish for myself to be the most honored. Until I wish for my brother to live in the best of homes, driving the best of cars, having the best of knowledge, having the best of jobs, having the best of deen and iman like I wish it for myself. Until that is there, your deen will always be incomplete. Today we thrive on the misery of our brothers and sisters. Here locally. Oh, oh, did they break up? Did their marriage break up? I told him she was a rat. <laughs> Love will thrive on it. Here's our deal. And many of the scholars have commented on this hadith. They say that when the Prophet of Allah says that you will not have complete faith until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. They said that when he implied brother here, he implied your brother in humanity. That until you start loving for Michael and Mark and Luke and John and Scott and 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 and, and, and Catherine and Tyrone, whatever their names are, until you start loving for them what you love for your own children, your faith will always be. Where is this deen? Where is it? Whose job is it to bring back this deen? <clears throat> you know whose job it is? You and I. You see, this deen was built on men. You know what sort of men? Don't be fooled by this, uh, you know, that Islam was spread by the sword. I've never heard so much rubbish in my life. That Islam was spread by the sword. No, Habib, no. Islam was spread by men. People who took responsibility. People who were man enough to admit when they were wrong. People who loved for their brothers, who loved for their neighbors, who loved for their countrymen, what they loved for themselves. This is how our deal was spread. Islam was spread. Why? Because it came to challenge the mind. It conquered nations. Why? Through the sword? Nonsense! 
It conquered through knowledge. Here comes a religion, right? Between the Persians and the Romans. Here comes a bunch of Arabs who now they come to you questioning the concept of God. Questioning, questioning the concept of religion. Questioning, they questioned everything. They allowed the mind to be free. They allowed the mind to explore. They allowed the mind to examine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, go and speak to the people. Go and speak to the rulers. Go and speak to the kings and to the, you know, go, test their minds. Learn, expand. This was the way of the Muslims to go. Dialect. Debating. Educate yourself. If you're claiming truth, we're claiming truth. Come, let's sit down. Let's have an open forum. What's your evidences? These are our evidences. They challenge the mind. They challenged the concept of God that was never done before that. Muslims questioned everything. Empowering the human being, empowering the mind. This was your deen, your forefathers brought this. This is how we conquered the world. People tell me that, you know, you Muslims are backwards towards your women. Well, how, how? You know, that's one thing. You know what hurts me more? We Muslims are starting to believe it. What are you talking about? We? We? The first university in humanity was built and established by a Muslim woman. The first right that was ever given to a woman was when the Prophet of Allah allowed that a woman can now inherit from her father. This was Islam. He came to change the world. To fulfill the rights. Anyway, I can yap on all day. Man. Forgive me, I get a bit worked up. <coughs> anyway, in short, change will never come until you and I wake up. And really stop looking here and there. And look here. <coughs> you know, someone once told me that when you point the finger, can you see that? He said, when you point the finger, know that there's three fingers pointing back at you. I am the woman. I am Islam. What am I going to do to change? How will I make a difference? How will I make an impact? And my brothers and sisters, wallahi, you will never make a change until you come back to your deen. Until you come back to that which made your Prophet and his companions the best of the best. Wallahi, it is only this that will bring us back to what we once were. It's the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the deen that's open to your and my interpretation. The deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How he understood it. How he implemented it. How he lived it. How he applied it. Until we bring that back into our lives, we will continue to suffer. So I hope in short, I've left no doubt in anyone's mind that the problem with the Ummah is you and I. And up and until we sincerely put up our hands and make a genuine intention to change, we're going to always be where we are. So inshallah, I'm going to end it with this, but before I wrap it up, I always like to speak to the brothers, and I want people to put up their hands and start sharing some intentions with me, what intentions they have from this night forward, what they're going to start doing to make themselves better Muslims and make their ummah a better ummah. So inshallah ta'ala, anyone who's game enough to raise up his hand, and wallah, it could be the smallest thing. Sometimes we think change is this big concept. You'll be surprised. You know what? We've lost touch with the little things. You know, the Prophet of Allah, he says, smiling in the face of your brother <coughs> is a charity. When was the last time you smiled in... Not in a girl's face. We're always smiling in girl's faces, yeah? <laughs> but really in your brother. When was the last time you seen a non-Muslim and you genuinely smiled from the depths of your heart? You really smiled at him just to make him happy. When? When was the last time you really extended your hand to help? Not for any reason. Really, you know what? Not even for the sake of... Just for the sake of humanity. 
Today I see Muslims do good things. But I don't know about you, but for me, they kill it. When he's falling, tumbling all over himself, just explain. Oh, look, you know, I just want to let you know that I helped you walk across the road because I'm a Muslim and that's what my religion teaches me. <laughs> Did you really have to state that? I mean, really, couldn't you have just helped across the road just for the sake that it's a good thing? Did you really have to oh, you know, because that's what my religion... And I just want you to know that, you know, look, I'm not like what they say on TV. 